Hello and welcome to News News live from Islamabad. I'm Jabhat Tehami and these are the headlines. The Taliban say they are committed to peace talks in Afghanistan. In a statement, Taliban's deputy head, Mullah Barada, said they want a genuine Islamic system in the country to end war and give women their rights. Meanwhile, a Taliban spokesperson said they have seized two districts in northern Balkh and Jozjan provinces. Amid rising violence, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani has replaced his defense and interior ministers and the army chief. Iran and world powers have adjourned nuclear talks for consultations in their capitals after they wrapped up the sixth round of negotiations in Vienna. Speaking to reporters, EU's envoy Enrique Mora gave no indication when the talks would resume but said progress has been made. He said stakeholders expect Tehran and the UN nuclear watchdog to agree on extending a monitoring deal of Iran's nuclear activities that expires next week. In India, three Muslims have been beaten to death by mobs on suspicion of stealing cattle in Tripura state. Police said the victims were caught by villagers as they were trying to smuggle cattle. Pakistan has received over 1.5 million more doses of the Chinese Sinovac coronavirus vaccine as the country looks to speed up vaccinations. Meanwhile, Brazil has become the second country in the world to have registered over half a million COVID-19 deaths. Globally, there are now more than 3.8 million deaths and over 178 million infections. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now with the news in detail. The Taliban say they are committed to peace talks in Afghanistan. Taliban's deputy head Mullah Barada said the world and Afghans have queries about the form of the political system after the withdrawal of the foreign troops. In a statement, Barada said they want a genuine Islamic system in the country to end war and give women their rights. He added women and minorities would be protected and diplomats and NGO workers would be able to work securely. Barada urged the Kabul administration to release Taliban prisoners committed under the Doha deal. Earlier in a meeting with the EU's envoy Thomas Nicholson in Doha, Barada said they are committed to the safety of embassies, charities and their employees in the country. In a tweet, a Taliban spokesperson said the two sides discuss the Afghan peace process. The Taliban say they have seized two districts in Afghanistan's northern Balkh and Jozjan provinces. A Taliban spokesperson said the Afghan security personnel surrendered and joined them. The group claims to have seized more than 40 districts in recent weeks across the rugged countryside. Amid rising violence, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani has replaced his defense and interior ministers and the army chief. Ghani also warned the Taliban of a serious response if they want enmity. He said the Taliban should decide between a political solution or continuing animosity. Pakistan and Turkey have discussed the Afghan peace process and the withdrawal of the foreign troops from Afghanistan. Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi and his Turkish counterpart Mevlu Shavasholu met on the sidelines of Intalia Diplomacy Forum in Turkey. Qureshi said Afghan parties must seize the historic opportunity for an inclusive and politically negotiated settlement. In a tweet, Qureshi congratulated Turkey on a vibrant and engaging Antalya diplomacy forum. He said the two countries share excellent bilateral relations. The foreign minister said he was glad to lend his support to the conference. Iran and world powers have adjourned nuclear talks for 
consultations in their capitals after they wrapped up the sixth round of negotiations in Vienna. Speaking to reporters, EU's envoy Enrique Mora gave no indication when the talks would resume, but said progress has been made. He said stakeholders expect Tehran and the UN nuclear watchdog would agree on extending a monitoring deal of Iran's nuclear activities that expires next week. Tehran's delegation chief Abbas Arakchi said they have reached closer to an agreement, but the remaining differences cannot be easily overcome. Washington left the deal in 2018 and reimposed sanctions on Tehran. Iran has since breached the deal's strict limits on uranium enrichment. Iran's president-elect Ibrahim Raisi has pledged to form a revolutionary and anti-corruption government. Judiciary chief Raisi won Iranian presidential elections by a landslide. In a victory statement, Raisi thanked Iranians for the massive turnout. He said that he will try to expand justice which was the prime objective of the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Meanwhile, the result of the poll has garnered mixed reactions from the international community. Pakistan, Russia, Turkey, Qatar, Kuwait, Syria, Iraq, as well as the UAE extended felicitations to Raisi. However, the US as well as the international rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, termed the election unfair. In Pakistan, the security forces have killed two terrorists in an intelligence-based operation in North Waziristan district of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. The military's media wing says the terrorists were active members of the banned organization Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan. The ISPR said the terrorists were involved in attacks on the security forces. The military said a soldier was also martyred during the exchange of fire in the spin bomb area of the district. 32-year-old Naik Nazakat Khan was a resident of Atak City. In India, three Muslims have been beaten to death by mobs on suspicion of stealing cattle in Tripura state. Police said the victims were caught as they were trying to smuggle cattle. This is the latest in a spate of cow vigilante attacks that have provoked alarm among religious minorities and underprivileged classes. Several dozen people have been killed and hundreds injured in mob attacks since 2014 when Prime Minister Narendra Modi's party came to power. Critics have accused the governing Hindu nationalist BJP of not doing enough to rein in such violence. Yemen Sudi rebels claim to have shot down a U.S. spy drone over Marib city with a surface-to-air missile. In a tweet, a Houthi spokesperson said the Scan Eagle drone was trying out hostile actions in the airspace of the Sarwa district. The spokesperson said they documented the whole operation and will release the video later. This comes a day after the Arab coalition said it shot down 17 Houthi drones launched towards southern Saudi cities. The coalition said the deliberate and systematic escalation by the Houthis is equivalent to war crimes. Earlier, the Houthis claimed to have successfully targeted King Khalid Air Base in Hamis Mashaid. The main coastal road linking Libya's east and west has been opened to give time to renegade General Khalifa Haftar to pull out mercenaries. In a tweet, Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dabibe said the move will work for Libya's development and prosperity. The development came after months of negotiations between the Government of National Accord and the Libyan National Army. Just hours earlier, General Khalifa Haftar forces closed the Libya-Algeria border and declared the area a military zone. Haftar also sent troops into the southern city of Sabha, which was already allied to the eastern forces. Despite progress towards a political solution, most of the country is still controlled by armed groups, including foreign mercenaries. Armenians are voting to elect a new parliament today after Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan called snap elections. Around 2.6 million people are eligible to vote to elect 101 member parliament for five years. Pashinyan, who has lost much of his popularity after a military defeat last year to Azerbaijan, is hoping to renew his mandate. Opinion polls suggest the party of Pashinyan and that of former President Robert Kocharyan are in a tight race. 
In a recent interview, Kocher Yan pledged to start negotiations on nagorno karabakhs borders if he came to power. A winning party or alliance needs at least 51 seats and can be assigned additional seats in order to form a government. Myanmar's military rulers have rejected the UN General Assembly's resolution calling for an arms embargo against the country. In a statement, the foreign ministry described the resolution based on one-sided allegations and false assumptions. It added that the letters of objection have been sent to the UN Secretary General and the General Assembly's President. The UN General Assembly paused the resolution on Friday and called on the military to restore the country's democratic transition. It also demanded Myanmar's armed forces to immediately release all the political detainees, including Aung San Suu Kyi. Meanwhile, daily anti-coup protests continue in Yangon and Mandalay, despite the killing of over 870 civilians by the military. More stories to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Brazil has become the world's second country to have more than half a million COVID-19 deaths. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.8 million lives and infected over 178 million people so far. What in this report? Brazil's COVID-19 numbers continue to rise amid president's skepticism as the government is accused of passing up earlier opportunities to buy vaccines. Only 11% of Brazilians are fully vaccinated and 29% have received the first dose. Thousands took to the streets across the country to protest President Jair Bolsonaro's pandemic response. He took too long to buy the vaccine. Herd immunity won't do any good. The only immunity you can get is with the vaccine. There is no early treatment as well. I have lost millions of friends, lost my cousin. Millions of people are orphans, fatherless, motherless and childless. Bolsonaro is genocidal. After wreaking havoc in India, the Delta variant is now ravaging several other countries as governments scramble to contain fresh outbreaks. The UK has announced it is now facing a third wave while the vaccine program races to outpace the Delta variant spread. Belgium is also set to ban entry to non-EU travellers from Britain to limit the spread of the feared variant. Meanwhile, Russia's capital Moscow reported the highest number of daily cases for the second day in a row. The city's hospitals are flooded with patients due to the Delta variant. The people we get in contact with every day, supermarket workers, taxi drivers, nurses and ticket sellers, etc. I would really want them to be alive and healthy. If we want to remain in an internal pandemic within Russia, to accept those people's handshake is a hazard. We would go on being COVID hostages and wait until it goes away by itself. But it won't go away by itself. In Afghanistan, the health officials have warned that deadly third surge of COVID-19 is worsening in the war-torn country amid acute shortages of oxygen supplies. Uganda is also witnessing a surge in infections made worse by an array of variants. Meanwhile, the UAE has decided to suspend travelers from Liberia, Sierra, Leon and Namibia from entering the country over rising cases. Pakistan has received over 1.5 million more doses of the Chinese Sinovac coronavirus vaccine as the country looks to speed up vaccinations. The National Command and Operations Center, the organization spearheading efforts against the virus, said another tranche of 2 to 3 million doses is expected next week. Pakistan has so far registered 21,977 deaths and more than 948,000 cases. More than 892,000 have recovered. World Refugee Day is being observed globally today with the United Nations theme of Together We Heal, Learn and Shine. Pakistan joined the world community to commemorate the day. Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said this day reminds the world to boost investment in conflict prevention and resolution. In his message, Qureshi said for over four decades, Pakistan has led by example in refugee protection. He said his country has contributed more than a fair share of international responsibility by hosting millions of refugees. 
The foreign minister noted Pakistan still hosts around 3 million Afghans, providing them necessary protection. Islamabad also paid tribute to the UN High Commission for Refugees for commendable work. Ethiopia is all set to hold national and regional parliamentary elections on Monday. Earlier, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said these will be the country's first free and fair polls after decades of repressive rule. Voting has been delayed in 110 out of 547 constituencies due to violent conflicts and logistical problems. Some opposition parties are also boycotting the elections over alleged harassment of their members. Abiy's Prosperity Party remains the front-runner in a field of 46 parties vying for the parliamentary seats. Some 37 million of Ethiopia's 109 million people are registered to cast ballots. The elections were originally scheduled for August last year, but Abiy Ahmed postponed them due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A Russian ambassador to the United States, Antony Antonov, has left for Washington. President Vladimir Putin and his U.S. counterpart, Joe Biden, agreed to return their respective envoys during the Geneva summit. While boarding a flight, Antonov said there is a lot of work to be done and Moscow is counting on progress. He said he is returning with an optimistic mindset and meetings will begin on Monday and will continue throughout the week. Moscow recalled Antonov for consultations after Biden said in March that he believed Putin was a killer. Later, the U.S. ambassador also returned to Washington for consultations. The Kremlin says a meeting between Russian President Vladimir Putin and the U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson is potentially possible. In an interview, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said, however, no preparations for such a meeting are currently underway. Peskov added that the meeting may repair the currently strained bilateral relations. Earlier, British Defence Secretary Ben Wallace also admitted the possibility of a meeting between Johnson and Putin. In Mexico, at least 18 people have been killed as gunmen aboard a number of vehicles attacked several neighborhoods near the U.S. border. Police said attacks occurred in the eastern part of Reynosa City, which borders Texas. Police said the clashes have caused widespread panic in the area. The shootings have mobilized the Army, National Guard, State Police and other agencies. Authorities said they have detained one person and seized three vehicles. They added the motive behind the attacks remain unknown. However, investigations have been launched into the attacks. In the U.S. state of Florida, one person has been killed and another injured as a car rammed into a crowd at a parade in Wilton Manors. Police say the driver has been taken into custody. They added that authorities are still gathering information on the collision. A witness said it was an intentional act right across the lanes of traffic. In a statement, the Democratic representative, Debbie Weiserman, said she was deeply shaken and devastated that a life was lost. Tropical storm Claudette has claimed 12 lives in Alabama as the storm swept across the southeastern U.S. It caused flash floods and spurring tornadoes that destroyed dozens of homes. Flash flood warnings were also issued for multiple states along the coast, including Florida, North Carolina and Georgia. Claudette had maximum sustained wind speeds of 65 km per hour. The storm also disrupted the Juneteenth celebrations that commemorate the emancipation of the African-American slaves. It's the time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back in southwest China. A research base of giant panda breeding has been building itself into a cradle for the endangered species. It has become a world-renowned must-see scenic spot. What in this report? The research base in Chandu welcomes a great number of panda enthusiasts every year. 
In March 2021, the research base opened the Giant Panda Museum that aims to provide an immersive experience while demonstrating various interesting facts about the precious species. The museum also hopes to increase visitors' understandings of giant pandas and other wild animals. Not only are giant pandas precious animals to the Chinese people, but they also hold a reputation around the world for being adorable and playful. The World Wide Fund uses a pattern of panda in the emblem and flag to call for the protection of all the precious and endangered species in the world. Giant pandas are an endangered species and live mainly in the mountains of northern Sichuan province and southern Gansu and Shanxi provinces. In recent years, conservation efforts have contributed to an increasing population of pandas with 500 to 1,000 mature adults. Giant pandas have been recategorized as vulnerable by the Red List in 2016, a mark of their growing population across the world. Chinese astronauts undertake rigorous training and study complex theories as part of preparation for the nation's booming space station missions. This report has the details on China's space heroes. Chinese astronauts strive to fulfill nation's space dream after years of training and testing as pressure builds up motivation and confidence guarantees success. In four to five years, astronauts have to study more than a hundred of theoretical courses as part of their training. Astronauts recall their experiences of training for the prestigious job as extremely arduous. Liu Yang, China's first female astronaut, flew into space in 2012 aboard Shenzhou-9 and completed 15 aeromedicine experiments. While the first Chinese astronaut to go into space thrice, Zheng Haipang recalled his tough endurance training overload. Recently, China successfully sent three astronauts into space aboard the Shenzhou-12 spaceship. Shenzhou-12 is the first manned mission during the construction of Tiangong to be completed by 2022. Another weather situation from around the globe. And that's all for now with the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indus.news.